like to welcome everyone today to First Baptist Church Sunday School. Today we're going to continue our study of the Lord's uh, Prayer. So far we've looked at God the Father, God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. Today we're going to be looking at forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Some versions say trespass, but We'll start off by reading today's uh, verses. Then this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Well, as I mentioned, today we're going to be in forgive us of our debts as we have also, as we have forgiven our debtors. We've changed a little bit. We've transitioned from Father in heaven. We've transitioned from Father, the, is his magnificent kingdom, Father's will. We're bringing it more and more down to earth as far as our needs. Last week we looked at give us today our daily bread. Today we're looking at forgive us of our debts. Forgive us of our sins. Now there's two mistakes that we can have in thinking about sin. The first is, well, I'm not really a bad person. I'm better than most. I really don't sin much. Or perhaps another way of looking at it is, I have sinned so greatly. I am so bad that I am beyond the reach of God's grace. Well, let me brief answer these questions. First, notice it did not say, forgive us of our debts. If we have any, I am reminded of this prayer that I am a sinner until Jesus comes again. Until he comes to take us and bring us home, I will sin. It, it is in my nature. I will do that. Now, hopefully, with God's grace, I will sin less, but I do sin. And so that takes care of the first uh, mistake that we can tell. The second is, Jesus says here, we are to come to him we are to ask him to forgive us of our debts, to forgive us of our sins. If Jesus is saying, come to me and pray this prayer, he will surely answer that prayer regardless of the sins that we're asking forgiveness for. I mean, if Jesus says it, I can take it to the bank and make the deposit. First John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's imagine if I, I come to the part of the prayer and I can't really think of any sins to ask forgiveness for, what to do then? Well, now that's, that's not my case, but there may be some that think, think that. I would first try a little harder, then go back to the very first part of the prayer where it says, hallowed be your name. When we think deeply, wholeheartedly about the holiness of God, we should become profoundly aware of our sins. We can look back and I, you know, how is life better for those who think deeply about the holiness of God and reflect on, on our own sins? When we look in the mirror and see the holiness of God, then our own sin, we should start to lose our grip on the thought that I have it all together, that I am without sin. There are songs, as a song goes, it's Amazing Grace. It's got a verse in there that says, that saved a wretch like me. 
Yeah. In our culture today, we are wanting to feel more, less like a worm or a wretched person. We have less or lack of genuinely result of facing our sin. But did you know some of the modern hymn book today, instead of saying that saved a wretch like me, says saved someone like me. Well, they take that emphasis on what a wretched person that we actually are. Saved and set me free is another way that they say that. And there's another, there's another song at the cross for such a worm as I sometimes we need to feel like a worm and recognize our sin for what it is they changed the words to say for sinners such as I you know some may say that well this is really no biggie it's just kind of maybe a modern version of an old classic However, it does change the way the writer was emphasizing their sin, which I believe this is symptomatic or problematic of our own stubborn desire to avoid the truth about our own sin. You know, there are some churches today that would say, Pastor, please make me feel good about myself just as I am. There's no reply for repentance. No reply of our need to acknowledge our sin. No reply we need to go before God and ask forgiveness. I read this statement. If we're going to go higher, we have to go lower. If we want more of God and his transforming power, we have to begin with some honesty about the way that we are living. I would ask this to say, how do we feel when we go before God? Well, I looked at Scripture and see what Scripture says about people that went before God. Abraham. When Abraham spoke to God about the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, he discovered God has some comments of his own in response, he says, or Abraham said, Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though what? I am nothing but ashes and dust. When you really connect with God, we have to come to the understanding that God is everything and we're not anything. Job. Job was a righteous man. God said he was a righteous man in human standards. But when he met God, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. The revealed nature of God showed Job how far he was fallen from God's holiness. Isaiah. Remember, God saw, I mean, uh, Isaiah saw God on the throne. That's the kind of relationship he had with God. He saw him on the throne. But then he fell on his face and said this, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I can just imagine Isaiah saying that. The sense of unworthiness is the immediate result of seeing God or meeting with God. If we go before God, if we go to church and only feel puffed up about our current state of holiness, we feel really good about ourselves, then I would ask the question, have you really met with God? Have you really seen his standard that he puts forth? God's standard of holiness is unattainable. 
His infinite holiness reveals that even the most righteous among us is not even coming close. Peter says, he revealed his glory to, to Peter at the uh, catching of the fish. What did Peter do? When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. That's what it means to meet with God. That's what it means to meet with God. Real contact with God produces a sense of immense, I believe, unworthiness. When we even see a glimpse of God, it's as if it should fill in our hearts. <coughs> Whoa. The standard is high, and I'm not making it. My soul, anguish in our soul is not a bad thing. But heartfelt grief is the first mark of true repentance. True repentance is heartfelt sadness about what I've done to God at the heart of every choice that I make to sin. When I choose the wrong, I'm really saying, you're not enough, God. I need this too. You have not met my needs, so I am going out on my own this time. It's as if I am slapping God's hand away. It's, reach, it's acting like God is reaching out to bless me, but I withdraw from his merciful love. Real penance, repentance recognizes that my sin is against God. So when we read, forgive us our debts, do we really ask ourselves, or do we really think that God will answer our prayer? Matthew says, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. <laughs> I just love it. When we pray, forgive us our debts, we are exercising our belief or trust, if you will, in God. We confess our sins before God because we believe he will forgive us because he has promised to do so. Well, you know, I read an article that said that some may say that God doesn't forgive. I mean, God forgives all of our sins, past, present, and future, when we come to know him as our Savior, when we become Christians. Why do we need to ask for daily forgiveness? When we pray, forgive us of our debts, we are praying just like a child who has not lived up to our father's expectations. We are saying, I'm sorry to our heavenly father so that we can again have fellowship with him. Because when we sin, we break that fellowship. Forgiveness of our debts is not our initial forgiveness, which we as a sinner, we received when we sought God for salvation. When we pray, forgive us of our debts, we are already a Christian who calls God our Father. We are already a child of the King. We are in the kingdom. When we pray, forgive us of our debts, we are asking for if you will, parental forgiveness because we are a child of the Father. Suppose when we were a child, and I'm sure that many of you did not do this, but I did. We sneak behind our Father's back 
and we do what he has told us not to do, was our father no longer our father because we went against his will? Well, the answer to that is absolutely no. A child is a member of the family by birth. Disobeying our father does not break the father-child relationship. But the fellowship between the father and the child is still intact. However, the father may be disappointed. So when we are praying, forgive us our debts, we are asking the father to restore our fellowship with him, not to restore the father-child relationship. Oh, that's huge. Let's look at the second part of that verse. Forgive us our debts as we have all, as we have forgiven our debtors. How many of us have ever had somebody do something bad against us? Do we hold a grudge against that person who has caused us this grief? Scripture tells us, for if you forgive others when people, for if you forgive other people when they stand against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But then there's verse 15. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. <coughs> well, let me first let me clarify that this verse does not teach us that our eternal destiny is based on us forgiving other people. However, it does teach us that our relationship with God will re be damaged if we refuse to forgive, to pardon, if you will, those who have offended us. The Bible is very clear that God forgives sin by His grace based on what Christ did on the cross alone not on man's actions. It does not mean that God makes some sort of a deal with us as if we can buy forgiveness from God by forgiving others. Jesus has already bought our forgiveness. We cannot plead with God to do for us what we will not do for others. Our prayer for forgiveness must, if it is real, influence our whole, our entire behavior. We might say that it is in forgiving that we are forgiven. But, okay, but what if we've been hurt really badly? What if we find it impossible to forgive others what to do then? Well, that's a tough one. But when we understand how much God has forgiven us, we are set free to forgive others. That's Jesus' whole point in this part of the Lord's Prayer. In this little two-verse commentary, he's, afterwards, we are constantly to reflect upon the fact that we have been forgiven much. Remember the sinful woman at Luke, Luke chapter 7. He crashed a party at Simon the Pharisee's house to anoint Jesus' feet. Jesus forgave her and said, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little loves little. Simon did not see himself as a big, as a sinner. But what was Simon's response? When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is that she is a sinner. Well, I'll tell you again, Simon did not see himself as a sinner. Simon did not think he needed much forgiveness, but he was wrong. 
Boy, it's so easy for us today to become trapped like Simon. Some of us were saved while growing up in Christian homes. And we didn't live a, a huge, horrible life. We did not associate with other sinners. We may not realize how much we have been forgiven <coughs> if we've lived such a life. One cure for this, I would encourage you to read the first four chapters of Romans a couple of times. That really describes about the sinful person. Forgive us our debts as we have given our debtors. In other words, God treat me like I treat other people as I forgive others. Do we forgive others? If we don't, we've asked God to deal with us the same way. Forgive me the way I forgive others. Well, we may say, I'll forgive them, but I'll have no more to do with them. God says, all right, I'll forgive you and never have any more to do with you. We say, well, I'll forgive, but I don't forget. God says, all right. I won't forget. Is it possible to be forgiven and not feel forgiven? First look at when we repent and turn to Jesus, we are forgiven. Our sin is covered by his perfect and righteousness, and we do not stand condemned any longer. Longer. However, if we struggle with the feeling of unforgiveness, the only solution is to keep turning back to what the Word of God teaches us about the reality of our forgiveness in Christ. If the Lord says that we have been given, forgiven, if we have been forgiven, and Jesus is our Savior, we have no right to question Him. In fact, it is a sin to doubt God's promises that he has forgiven us. First John says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Returning to For returning to the Word, returning to the promises that God has made to us should strengthen our faith and give us the confidence that we have been forgiven. Go to the Word, Colossians says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them by triumphing over them by the cross. Going back to the word, we see God has paid the price. The Bible tells us that the devil and his demons attack believers primarily through accusing us of, of, of our sins. They constantly seek to convince us that God could not possibly forgive us. Let these words sink in one more time of what Christ has done. Christ has cast down Satan in defeat, having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Christ has won. If we do not feel good, if we not if we do not confess to feel good, we confess to be forgiven. Forgiveness feels good. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Let's bow with me for a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for these verses. Father, we thank you for this example of prayer. Father, we do come before you today asking forgiveness of our sins. 
Father, we still come together today to ask for, to be with uh, our country. Be with us in this time of trouble and turmoil that we're experiencing. Father, give us leadership. Father, we're so thankful for all that you do. We're so thankful, Father, that you promised you forgive us. And we depend upon that, Father. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, we are looking forward to possibly uh, the church reopening next week. I would encourage everyone to view their emails this week for additional instructions. It will be good again to be in the house of the Lord. I will say that uh, while we will, we anticipate opening up the sanctuary, it's still going to be a little while before we continue our Sunday school class. So until next week, have a good week, and Christ be with you.